It doesn't roll. I just figured that out. Okay, thank you. Learning new things every day. Um, Dr. Thomas, would you please uh, state your name and spell it for the record? Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S. Can you tell us what your profession is? I'm a forensic pathologist. What training did you have f uh, to prepare you to become a forensic pathologist? I uh, have a bachelor's degree from Oberlin College in Ohio. Then I have a medical degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Then I did a residency in anatomic and clinical pathology, also at the University of Michigan, and that was a four-year uh, training program. And then I did a one-year fellowship in forensic pathology at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office in Minneapolis. Do you have any board certifications? Yes, I'm board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. What year did you begin working as a forensic pathologist? Well, I finished my fellowship in 1988, so 31 years. Um, can you tell the jury where you have worked as a forensic pathologist? After I finished my fellowship, I worked at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. And then in 1997, I started working at the Minnesota Regional Medical Examiner's Office, which uh, is also in Minnesota, south of the Twin Cities. And I was the chief medical examiner for eight counties in Minnesota. And then in uh, 2013, that office merged with Hennepin County. And so then I worked back at Hennepin County. And then I retired from Hennepin County in um, 2017, and since then I've worked uh, part-time in uh, various places around the country. Where are you licensed? Um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Nevada, Utah, and Tennessee. Have, do you belong to any professional organizations related to your field? Yes. What are those? Uh, the National Association of Medical Examiners, um, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, College of American Pathologists, Minnesota Coroners and Medical Examiners Association, uh, Minnesota Medical Association, American Medical Association. There may be some others, but those are the main ones. <laughs> Have you done any teaching at the university or medical school level? Um, yes, I've taught at, uh, well, I've taught forensic pathology fellows. I've taught uh, forensic, uh, sorry, um, pathology residents at both of those at Hennepin County. And then I've uh, taught at um, also pathology residents at the University of Minnesota. Have you published any articles in your field? Yes. Do you know how many? Um, 10 or 11, something like that. I just gave a copy to the prosecutor. Is that a copy of your curriculum vitae? Um, yes. Let me just check here. What is that number again? Pardon me? What is that exhibit number? 714. 714. Thank you. So I've been to a couple of more conferences since then, but it's pretty much up to date. <laughs> Judge, I would move Exhibit 714. Any objection? No. All right, Exhibit 714 will be received. Have you given presentations and lectures? Yes. Do you know about how many? I really don't. I mean, I've talked to law enforcement and to other forensic pathologists, um, coroners, medical examiners, lots of student groups. So I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. To, would it be fair to say that takes up several pages in your curriculum vitae? It does, yes. The listing that you haven't memorized? Right. Okay. And have you given any presentation and lectures specific to sharp force injuries? Yes, I have. Can you tell the jury what those are? Um, the most recent one was last year to the South Dakota Coroners Association. I gave a talk on interpreting and evaluating sharp force injuries. 
Did you also do one in 2006 in Minnesota? Yes. Have you taken post-fellowship training? Um, well, or gone to conferences? Right. Yes, I've gone to lots of conferences since I finished my fellowship. Have you received any awards in your field as a forensic pathologist? Yes. Can you tell us what those are? Um, actually, I just got one last week, which was kind of a surprise, from the National Association of Medical Examiners uh, for my service to their organization. I had previously gotten one also from the National Association of Medical Examiners, and I had gotten one from um, a police department in Minnesota for um, assisting with a particular case. Have you, in, I'm going to ask you about testifying. You've had a long career, so I'm just going to limit it to the past 10 years. In the past 10 years, have you testified uh, in court for the, uh, regarding forensic pathology? Yes. And in those past 10 years, approximately how many times have you been called as a witness by the prosecution? Um, I think it's like 34 times, so it's about uh, about 60% of the time that I've testified has been um, for the prosecution. How many times for the defense in a criminal case? Um, I think six, so about 10, 11% of the time. Okay, well those numbers don't add up to 100, so are there also civil cases? Yes, so civil cases are like wrongful deaths or um, motor vehicle crashes, nursing home deaths things like that, and that's um, the rest, like 30% of the cases. Okay. Um, I am going to ask you about um, questions pertaining to this case, and I'm going to show you um, what's been marked as exhibit number 715. Did you write a report in connection with uh, what you reviewed in this case? Yes. Is that Exhibit 715? Yes. Uh, Judge, I would move Exhibit 715 in evidence. Any objection? No. Exhibit 715 will be received. All right. Were you, um, in your review um, of the case uh, concerning the death of Alex Woodworth um, in the state of Wisconsin versus Ezra McCandless, can you please advise what you reviewed that's relevant to forensic pathology? Um, I reviewed the provisional and final autopsy protocols on Mr. Woodworth, mm -hmm. autopsy photographs, Wisconsin State Crime Lab reports, Dr. Tovar's report, uh, photographs of Ms. McCandless, Wisconsin State Patrol crime scene documentation report, uh, scene photographs, the Dunn County Sheriff's Office reports and diagrams, uh, Ramsey County Medical Examiner evidence and release forms. Okay, did you also review, um, well, go ahead, go ahead with the list. Um, multiple statements by Ms. McCandless, uh, photographs of a knife, photographs of the vehicle, medical records from Mayo Clinic, Eau Claire Police Department reports, and a chapter from a, uh, medicine textbook. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to first ask you about are cuts to Ezra McCandless and other injuries. I'm going to show you a number of exhibits. All right, I'm showing you, I'm, I'm going to give them all to you, but I'm just going to read, put their numbers in the record. Number 636. 637, 638, and 174. Those pertain to Ms. McCandless, and then later I'll be asking you about exhibit number 4 and 4B. Okay? But first right. I'm going to ask you about the first set. I'll ask about that a little bit later if I need to. So, um, but you do have it in front of you, just don't have the enlargement. All right, first let me ask you about Ms. McCandless. Have you examined all of the cuts to her in Exhibit 174? And um, I think it's 260. I'm sorry, I forgot the numbers on the back of those blow-ups. Uh, 636, 637, 638. 
Have you examined those uh, injuries? Yes. And what would you call those injuries? Um, they're mostly sharp force injuries. They're incisions, meaning that they're superficial. Uh, but a couple of them I would consider puncture, meaning that they're a little uh, deeper. Where do you see the puncture wounds? Um, those were on her um, leg. Let me describe it better. Um, the outside or lateral aspect of her upper right leg. Medically, are you able to determine whether or not these wounds are self-inflicted or inflicted by another person? No. Why not? Well, all I can tell from looking at the photographs is that they're sharp force injuries. So it's the sort of injury that we consider to be inflicted by something like a knife or piece of glass or, uh, you know, anything that has a really sharp edge. But there's no way looking at a wound for me to tell whether it's self-inflicted or whether someone else did it. There's, there's just no way to tell. And would it be scientifically acceptable for another physician to make that determination? Objection. Uh, I'm going to overrule. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't think there's any way that anyone can tell how those injuries occurred. Let me ask specifically, um, when you look in one, exhibit number 174, um, would and particularly looking at the wounds in the first few pictures, the vaginal area, the inner thigh, um, would you say that those lines are all parallel or not? Uh, no. Some, I mean, some of them are parallel and some of them are perpendicular, and then a little further along, they're uh, more diagonal. And in your opinion, can these be inflicted by another person if the person being cut is laying still? Yes. Do you know what defensive wounds are? Well, defensive wounds are a term that we use as forensic pathologists uh, to describe injuries that are in certain locations that we that are consistent with someone attempting to defend themselves. So it could be a gunshot wound through the hand when someone put their hand up. It could be a bruise in a certain location, but typically we use it with sharp force injuries. And most often we think of wounds to the hand because if someone is wielding a knife, we're likely to put up our hands to defend ourselves. But it can also be uh, on the leg or whatever, an arm, whatever body part is being used to try and get the, uh, the implement that's causing injury to go away. It doesn't mean that they are defensive wounds. It's just that we have, from experience, seen these in cases where someone was being injured with a knife. And so they're cons I would say they're consistent with uh, defensive wounds. Now, I'm going to ask you specifically about the wounds to the palm of Ms. McCandless's hand. That's in exhibit number 638. Is that wound what you would call a defensive wound? Yes, it's certainly consistent with a defensive wound. In your professional experience, with all the years you've done autopsies, have you seen defensive wounds that are similar to that hand wound? Yes. And do defensive wounds to the hands have to be deep? No, they can be deep or superficial or, I mean, it totally depends on, you know, how much pressure is being applied, uh, how sharp the knife or implement is. There's, there's lots of factors. I'm going to ask you also specifically if you would look in exhibit number 174. There is... Um, picture with a red mark to Miss McCandless's neck. Do you see that in there? Yes. Okay. And looking at the red mark that you see on her neck, what is that consistent with? 
So uh, it's along the right side of her neck, sort of just below the angle of the jaw. And uh, to me, it looks like what we call an abrasion or a scrape. And it's where the superficial layer of skin has just been uh, removed. So it um, could be from anything causing friction that uh, scrapes the superficial layer of skin. Is that wound consistent by being grabbed on that side of the neck by, a, uh, if Ms. McCandless was grabbed on that side of the neck with somebody else? Uh, yes. By it, somebody else, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Um, yes, it, it's consistent with, uh, um, say, a fingernail scratch, uh, you know, sort of a, a long, a large, not just a little cut, but more of a broad. Um, it's consistent with some fabric perhaps being grabbed and uh, rubbed. So yeah, it, it's consistent with that. Mm -hmm. um, do you see in some of the photos also that she has some small injuries to her lips? Yes. And what are those consistent with? Uh, those could be either very superficial sharp force injuries, like with the tip of a knife or something sharp, or they could also be um, scrapes like with a fingernail or something. Um, let me ask you some questions about whether or not in your practice you have seen injuries um, in autopsies from sexual, well, first of all, do you know what BDSM is? Yes. What is it? Uh, bondage, dominance, uh, sadomasochism, I think. Okay. And in your practice, have you seen injuries from BDSM practices? Uh, yes, I have seen cases like that. All right. Are you familiar from uh, looking at medical literature of injuries um, that have occurred um, from BDSM practices that are seen um, with, with sharp force implements or knives? Yes. I, I haven't seen any personally, but I'm familiar with that in the literature. Um, all right. I'm going to move to ask you now some questions about um, the injuries to Alexander Woodworth and the autopsy. First of all, what is the definition of homicide? So um, as forensic pathologists, we have five options for manner of death. It's natural, accident, suicide, homicide, or undetermined. And homicide is a term that we use when the death is at the hands of another. So, for example, we might use it if two people are out hunting and one inadvertently shoots the other person. Uh, we would consider that a homicide because it's death at the hands of another. Like sort of the flip side is motor vehicle crashes we consider accidents even though the person may be charged with criminal vehicular homicide. So the point about our terminology for homicide is it doesn't translate into uh, a legal term. It could be you know, self-defense, it could be manslaughter, it could be murder, it could be any range of things. But from our perspective, it's just death at the hands of another person. So it's fair to say that just because something's a homicide does not necessarily mean there's criminal responsibility. It, it could be, that depends on other factors. Correct. All right. Let me ask you about measuring a person's height at autopsy. Um, when you measure a person's height at autopsy, is that necessarily the same as their height uh, when they were alive? No, I'd say more often than not, it's probably not the same height. Um, the reason is when you're standing up, you, at least, I don't know about you, but when I stand to be measured, I stand as tall as I can. Whereas when someone is lying on a table, we're measuring from the bottom of their foot to the top of their head. But if their knees are bent slightly, or if, uh, you know, they have really thick shoes and they get measured before the shoes are removed, there could be uh, quite a bit of uh, variability. And uh, would it be typical for somebody to measure shorter at autopsy than they are in real life? Yes, uh, because of the, the knees being bent, I would say it's probably more common. And uh, would, uh, would it be consistent with what you've seen if somebody is 5'11 and they measure 5'8 at autopsy? Yeah, that's certainly possible. Thank you. 
All right, now I'm going to ask some questions as to Mr. Woodworth's injuries. Uh, what is your opinion as to what his cause of death was? Um, I agree that his cause of death was multiple sharp force injuries. Um, and in layperson's terms, would that be saying he bled to death? Yes, he bled to death from the cuts and um, stab wounds that he got. You've reviewed all of his wounds, right? Correct. Did you review all of the photographs from the Ramsey County Medical Examiner's Office? Yes. And do, looking at the totality of the wounds, how many wounds were there to Mr. Woodworth? Um, I don't remember. Okay. Um, Does 16 sound familiar to you? Yeah, that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And looking at those wounds, um, how long could Mr. Woodworth survive after receiving all of these wounds? Um, so sometimes people get wounds that we can tell are pretty much immediately fatal. So for example, if someone has their carotid artery cut, which is the main artery that takes blood into the brain, um, someone will bleed out very rapidly from that. Or if they have a wound to their aorta, which is the main vessel that takes blood from the heart, um, or some really major artery. Virtually everything else, like um, with Mr. Woodworth, there's really no way to tell exactly how long someone would have lived. Uh, certainly, he had significant injuries, so I don't think he would have lived a long period of time, but none of his injuries were so immediately or instantly fatal that he would have died right away. So uh, that's about the best I can do. You know, minutes, maybe maybe several minutes, maybe, I don't know, maybe a half hour, but um, I don't think several hours, so All right. I, I can't really be more specific. So you're giving a range of minutes at the low end to 30 minutes at the top end? Is that kind of where your yeah. belief is? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, yes. Um, now, and that does that include you're considering the wound to the head, correct? Yes. All right. Um, after receiving these wounds, would Mr. Woodworth be able to walk? Well, there's none of these wounds would be instantly incapacitating. So, you know, if someone had a wound to their spinal cord, they wouldn't be able to walk, but he didn't. So I would say, yes, he would be able to walk after these. What about talking? Again, none of these wounds interfered with his vocal cords. So, um, so I would say yes, he would be able to talk. Would Mr. Woodworth be able to, with these wounds, get, if, if he had suffered the majority of these wounds in a vehicle, would he be able to get out, walk for 10 to 15 feet, lay down, and then get back into a vehicle? I, I would say yes. Again, none of these wounds would prevent him from doing those things. Well, then you took my next question away, which oh, is why you sorry. reached that conclusion, but that's sorry. fine. Um, would he be able to take off his coat? Yes, I would think so. Would he be able to take off his shoes? Yes. I'm going to ask specifically about... Uh, the injuries to his lungs, all right? First of all, I'm going to ask you about what a pneumothorax is. Could you please explain what that is? Sure. The way our lungs work is they're kind of like bellows that when you take in a breath, it's the expansion of your rib cage that causes the lungs to expand. And so it's kind of a, a negative pressure actually suctioning your lungs out to open them up to take in air. And when someone has an injury that allows air from the outside to get into the space around the lungs, so on the inside of the chest but on the outside of the lungs, then that prevents that kind of bellows action. And so air inside the chest cavity is called a pneumothorax. So pneumo is air and thorax is the chest. And uh, when someone has a pneumothorax, that can put uh, pressure on the lungs, and depending on the size of the pneumothorax, it can completely collapse the lung or just uh, you know, put a little pressure on the lungs. 
Were you able to observe when you looked at the autopsy photos whether or not Mr. Woodworth had a pneumothorax? No, I couldn't really tell. Um, how long does it take a pneumothorax to develop at, if one is uh, stabbed in the lower lobe of their lungs? Um, so I would say it's really variable how long a pneumothorax takes to develop. It would depend on the size of the wound, uh, the direction of the wound, whether it was more open or more closed, uh, the, where in the lungs uh, the wound occurred. So I, I would say it's probably pretty variable. And um, can somebody have a pneumothorax <coughs> but still be able to walk and talk? Yes. All right. And just to look at the photographs of the lungs and the autopsy pictures in exhibit number 4B, you have examined, let me just try to get to the right pictures. And just so it's clear, you've examined all of these photographs that are in exhibit uh, the exhibit number four from this trial? Yes. That were taken by the Ramsey County Medical Examiner's Office? Yes. All right. So you're looking at um, the page, uh, well, that's Sharp Force Injury 16. I think it's Sharp Force Injury 16 and Sharp Force Injury, let's find the other one just to clarify. All right. So looking at sharp force injury number eight, what are we looking at here? Um, this is a photograph of the uh, lung that has a, um, a sharp force injury in the lung. All right. And looking at sharp, uh, the last page at sharp force injury number 16, what is that? Um, there are two photographs. One is the lung and one is the inside of the rib cage. Okay. So with those examination of those injuries in mind, um, did the sharp force injury to those lungs, um, were they, and considering the other photographs that you've examined, did they, um, was there any major vessel that would bleed a great deal cut, to the lung, cut in those injuries to the lungs? No, so the main vessels to the lungs come from the heart, to and from the heart, and they're in sort of the center part of the lungs, and his uh, wounds to the lungs were more in what's considered the periphery or the distant part of the lungs, and so the, there aren't any large vessels there. They're just little vessels. Can you t explain to the jury what a hemothorax is? So hemo, meaning blood, is the hemothorax is the accumulation of blood in the chest cavity. So again, inside the chest, but outside the lung. Uh, did Mr. Woodworth have a hemothorax? No. How long does it take a hemothorax to develop um, with a stab wound to the lungs? Well, again, it really depends on where in the lungs the injury occurs. If it's centrally and one of the main vessels is hit, one of the large vessels, then it will develop almost right away. Uh, but if it's more peripheral or depending on, you know, the size, there are a lot of variables, but uh, it, it may take quite a while, minutes or longer to develop. And would his injuries to his lungs uh, prevent him from walking for 10 or 15 feet? No. Or talking? No. So is it fair to say he would not have developed complications from the stab wounds to his chest that would immediately cause him to be able to walk, talk, or live for this period of minutes to 30 minutes? Um, yes, I would say the injuries to his lungs would not be immediately either fatal or incapacitating. Okay, I would ask you to also look in that exhibit, exhibit four, for photographs of a wound to his lower abdomen and the scrotal area.
Yes, uh, sharp force injury number 11. Would those, that wound. Oh, sorry, and uh, number 12. Okay, I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> uh, would either of those wounds cause uh, the person who suffered those wounds to uh, feel an urge to urinate? I would say yes. Why is that? Uh, these wounds um, entered the urinary bladder. Let me just check. I think it was number um, the one number eleven, the one to the lower part of the abdomen, um, entered the urinary bladder, and so that would feel like obviously very irritating to the urinary bladder, and it would there may be blood accumulating in the bladder. But also, when you feel an irritation of the bladder, it feels like you have to empty your bladder. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone with that injury felt the need to empty their bladder. Um, have you looked at all of the scene photographs in this particular case? Yes. And in looking at the scene photographs, uh, where did you observe blood? Uh, both inside the car and outside of the car. And medically, would that be consistent um, with him being stabbed in the car, getting out, walking or laying down, and at some point returning to the vehicle? Yes. Are all of your opinions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. I don't have any further questions. All right, then uh, who's going to cross-examine? Uh, I am, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Roth, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Ms. Tom or Dr. Thomas. Good morning. Oh, uh, ju Judge, I'm so sorry. I forgot to ask a question of Dr. Thomas. Counsel, is it all right if I do no that? All right. I, yep. you your indulgence. Your Thank you. I, I forgot to ask you, uh, you, you were hired by the defense in this case, right? Yes. Okay. When you're hired by a party, if your opinion is adverse to what they're interested in, do you tell them that? Oh, yes. Does the fact that you get paid by counsel affect your opinion one way or another? No. All right. Nothing further. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Nordoff, you can go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. I'm going to refer to Exhibit 715. That's your written report in this case? Yes. And I just want to go through all of the different materials that you were provided. So you were provided the provisional and final autopsy protocols, correct? Yes. Um, and then did you receive five different discs of autopsy <coughs> photographs? Uh, there were a lot. Uh, I, five sounds about right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then it indicates Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory reports that you reviewed. Um, are those specifically the toxicology and then DNA results? Probably, yes. Uh, it indicates you reviewed Dr. Tovar, that's a defense expert um, written report. I don't remember who that was, sorry. Uh, but you reviewed still his, his report. Right. Um, you reviewed different photographs of the defendant spanning approximately two and a half months? Yes. Um, the state crime or state patrol crime scene documentation report and photographs? Yes. Is that the diagrams? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then the different statements by the defendant um, from different agencies, correct? Yes. Did you receive any transcripts from the, the defendant's interviews with the Detective Prague? Um, I don't know if they were transcripts or just summary statements. I don't remember. And then you indicate photographs of a muddy tack force folding knife? Yes. Uh, do you recall, was it the same knife that had a EMT written on the handle? I don't recall. Um, scene photographs, do you know who took those scene photographs? Did they say crime lab on I, the bottom? Or? I assume it was uh, either the crime lab or uh, state patrol or Dunn County Sheriff or um, you know law enforcement agencies that were investigating. Um, and then medical records from Mayo Clinic relating to the defendant? Yes. Uh, Eau Claire Police Department reports? Yes. Um, and then a chapter on forensic emergency medicine? Yes. Um, fair to say there's thousands of documents of reports in this case? Yes. Did you review all of them? Um, I reviewed all of the ones that I had. 
Okay, so all of the ones that the defense provided you, you reviewed? Right. Okay. Is there anything else I'm missing that you were provided? Um, not that I know of or can think of at this point. And doctor, is it fair to say your specialty and primary focus is uh, performing autopsies? Um, at this point, I mean, it certainly has been most of my career. At this point, since I've retired from my main job, I do autopsies some, and I do consulting, and then I also work with a uh, tissue donation organization reviewing medical records. So at this point, my practice is a little more varied than just autopsies. But you, you're not an emergency room physician. Oh, emergency I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, I'm strictly a forensic pathologist. And so as a forensic pathologist, your patients, if we want to call them that, are deceased? Right? Correct. Okay. Um, and when you perform autopsies, um, and I know it's been some time since it's been your primary focus, um, but when you did them, you generally received the body, some clothes, and maybe a little bit of background information. Does that sound right? Um, so I think, I think the, the answer to your question is um, at the time you do the autopsy, you may only have a little bit of information, but um, before a forensic pathologist comes to a conclusion about the cause and manner of death, we look at all kinds of information. So past medical history, past social history, um, maybe psychiatric history, what their, what was happening around the time of death. Then we look at the scene information, the autopsy, the toxicology, maybe some other studies, and put all of that together. Sure. So, I mean, you look for background information relating to the patient who you're doing the autopsy on. Correct. So you, you don't generally, though, wait for DNA results related to the scene. You don't wait for transcripts of written recordings. I mean, your, your primary concern is the patient or individual you did the autopsy on, correct? It really depends on the specifics of the case. Um, if we need some of those ancillary tests in order to determine the cause or manner of death, then we would wait. Uh, but if the cause and manner of death are pretty clear right from some preliminary information, then uh, you're correct. We would not have to wait for that. And in this case, to determine the cause and manner of death, you didn't need the thousands of documents and DNA re results. No, this was pretty straightforward. Um, and in this case, you never examined the actual body of Alexander Woodworth. Correct. Um, so I, I want to talk about the second page of your report now on Exhibit 715. And because we went over, you received a wide array of information. Um, but looking at page two, the third full paragraph that starts with on 322.18. Do you see yeah. that portion? Yes. Um, is it correct to say that, I guess, this narrative portion is essentially an abbreviated summar summary of the relevant information um, that you received from the defense? Yes. And so, to be clear, you're not stating to a reasonable degree of medical certainty the information in this narrative portion is correct? No, this is just uh, a summary of the information that was provided in various documents. But as a professional witness, you would agree that your report needs to be accurate, correct? Yes. So would you agree that on the second or third full paragraph you wrote, Jason Mengel contacted the police because he was looking for um, Ms. McCandless? And then around 12 o'clock, the Eau Claire police contacted her. Yes. And if I told you that it was, in fact, a janitor across the street from Alexander Woodworth's house who called the police and not Jason Mengel, would you agree that this portion of your report is not accurate? Yes, if that was true. Uh, then if you look at the fifth paragraph down, in the middle of that paragraph that starts with on 322.18, um, it, you state, she stated she had been physically and sexually assaulted by Mr. Woodworth, but was unable to clearly remember what had happened. Did you see that sentence? Yes. And if I told you that no witness has testified that the defendant said she was sexually assaulted 
by Mr. Woodworth. Would you agree that your Judge, report? I'm going to object to that. And what's your basis? The basis is she's saying if no witness has testified, Ms. McCann has testified that she was attacked and being cut in the labia certainly would, in my opinion, be defined, or the labia or the vaginal area, mons pubis, would be defined as a sexual assault, in my opinion. It's contact with a weapon with an intimate part of the body. Right, well, I'll just sustain your objection to that extent. Thank you. Okay, so your um, ultimate opinion in this case is you agree with Dr. Mills, uh, Kelly Mills, who testified, I think, really early in this trial, that the um, cause of Mr. Woodworth's death was complications of multiple sharp force injuries. Is that right? Yes. And your report indicates that the primary complication was uh, loss of blood, right? Yes. And that's... Uh, I think you start primarily from the neck and scrotum? Yes. I'd like to show you a couple of the photographs from exhibit number four. Uh, that's the PowerPoint that Dr. Mills. Right, she has them up there. Yep, I wanna put them on my screen so I can go through uh, some of these. Um, one minute, counsel, I just wanna. Okay. So if we look at slide number seven, which depicts sharp force injuries number two through four. Do you agree with Dr. Mills that these wounds proceeded through the soft tissue of the neck um, into the right external jugular vein muscle and then through a small branch of the internal jugular vein? Yes. And that these wounds were approximately one inch each deep and five and a half inches in length? Yes. Judge, I just want to point out there's multiple pictures showing. Oh, sorry. Time, um, if counsel wants to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then if I proceed to slide number 12. Uh, this depicts uh, sharp force injury number 12 to the scrotal sac, correct? Yes. And uh, looking at this wound to the scrotal sac, it would have bled profusely, correct? Yes, it looks like there's bleeding within the scrotum also. And if we go to the next slide, slide 13, uh, that injury correlates directly with the both underwear and uh, pants in this case, correct? Yes. You also opined that the injury to the head could have contributed to his death? Yes. And that's um, as a result of bleeding in the subdural space, putting pressure on the brain? Yes. Okay. And looking at slide number five, this wound was approximately, do you agree, about it, one and a half inches above the right ear canal? Yes. And this injury actually went through the temporal bone, correct? Correct. And would you agree it takes a substantial amount of force to stab through a bone? Yes. And would you agree that the trauma caused by uh, the force going through the temporal bone could result in dizziness and um, dis disequilibrium? It certainly could, yes. And you agree that this caused... Um, bleeding outside of the brain, right? Yes. And you also observed, as well as Dr. Mills, a subarachnoid hemorrhage in the right temporal lobe of the brain? Yes. And a subarachnoid hemorrhage can lead to permanent brain death or damage, correct? Yes. And that blood on the brain um, can put pressure, causing a, another, a number of variety of issues, correct? Yes. Finally, you opine that the uh, stab wounds to the lungs could have contributed to his death as well? Yes. Um, and I don't believe your report indicated which wounds those are, but I believe, based on your testimony today, that was sharp force injury number eight. Is that right? Yes. And this stab wound was actually quite deep at three and three eight inches in depth, correct? Yes. And if I told you that the blade of the knife used in this case was approximately three and a half inches, 
the depth of this wound was approximately the entire length of the blade. Yes. Right? Yes. And that wound goes, if I turn to the next slide, through the, excuse me, sorry, slide number 11. Um, actually, I think I'm on the wrong slide. No, here it is. No, that's right. Yep, and it actually went um, through here right on this uh, picture over to the right through the lung, correct? Yes. And then there was a second wound to the lung. If I turn to slide number 17. And that's a, as a result of sharp force injury number 16, if I understood your testimony correct? Yes. And the depth of this wound was two and three fourths inches, correct? Cor correct. And this goes um, into the lower lobe, of, lower lobe of the lung as well, correct? Yes, the, the other lung, the right lung. So if I show you slow, slide number 19, this is showing both of the internal organs as it's going through uh, into the lung, correct? Yes, the rib cage on the left side and then the lung on the right side. And there are small blood vessels by the lungs, correct? Uh, there are small blood vessels in the lungs and also uh, in the chest wall. So Alex sustained injuries to both his left and right lungs that have, could have contributed to his death, in addition to the neck, scrotal sac, and head wound into the brain. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm done with exhibit number four, but I still want my screen up if I could. So I want to show you, um, actually, you, do, would you agree with the testimony of Dr. Tovar that the injury to the scrotal sac would have been very painful? Yes. Um, in fact, if I show you exhibit number 14 that's previously been entered into evidence, um, that is the, the underwear and it's absolutely saturated with blood, correct? Yes. And if you look at the underwear, it looks like it's supposed to be white in color, correct? Correct. And because of an injury to the scrotal sac, um, I'm done with the screen, thank you. They could cause a person to reach in the area of that injury, correct? Certainly. And pain could cause a person to be kneeled over in, in pain as well? Sure. And would you agree that the internal jugular vein is a large vein? Yes. And that there's a substantial uh, blood, blood flow through that vein as well? Yes. And would you also agree that sever, severing of the external internal jugular vein would also result in large blood loss? Yes. I need the screen one more time, sorry. If I show you exhibit number 25, you don't need the lights. Um, this sweater shows actually a large amount of blood loss on the upper portion of the sweater, correct? Yes. And if we turn to exhibit 22, it covers a good portion of the sweater as well, correct? Yes. And if you lose a sufficient volume of blood, you'll go into shock, correct? Yes. And if you lose a sufficient volume of blood, it will also cause you to lose consciousness, correct? Yes. Um, in the next part of your report, you opined that uh, it's possible that the defendant's wounds were self-inflicted as well, right? Yes. And aside from suicide deaths, you don't see a lot of self-inflicted knife wounds, correct? Um, well, there's a phenomenon known as cutting that especially teenagers, but even some adults do, um, that is not generally thought to be a suicidal gesture, um, but is something that we see in um, people that we do autopsies on, is that kind of cutting. But I'm not sure if that's your question. Sure, no, I, I appreciate the explanation. But would you agree with me that an ER doctor who sees patients who are still alive would see more cutting or self-inflicted wounds as you describe them? Um, I guess it would depend on their practice. Um, certainly, as forensic pathologists, we see uh, cutting both in this sort of non-suicidal way as well as uh, suicides. But I'm, I'm sure ER physicians see it also. Uh, 
gently approach your honor? Great. I'm showing you it's been marked as Exhibit 195. Is this the chapter uh, that you received from the defense uh, regarding forensic emergency medicine? Yes. And I'm going to direct your, if you don't mind me oh, touching it, sorry. Okay. I'm going to direct you to page 14. And do you recall reading page 14? I believe it says DOJ 2708 at the bottom. Yes. Okay, and I'd like to publish that for the jury. Thank you. You may. Go ahead. Yep. Is that it? Previously authorized. Where are you? Yes. Is that, is that received? I thought so. Yes. So 195 is already in the record. Very good. You may publish. <coughs> Okay, do you see where, if you wouldn't mind reading where um, this first line that starts with patients. Patients with self-inflicted wounds may visit the ED emergency department claiming an accident, self-defense, or assault. Yep, if you can continue. When the patient history, injuries, and forensic evidence are not consistent, the forensically informed emergency clinician is in a unique position to extrapolate the truth. And would you agree with that statement? Uh, it's a little grandiose, I would say, extrapolate the truth. Um, I think emergency physicians, probably like all of us, are pretty skeptical about the patient history and interpret it in the context of all the information they have. Um, but emergency physicians get to talk with the patient, get to observe the, the injuries firsthand, correct? Right. Um. And then if you could just continue with that sentence. Um, with an understanding of how to identify the patients with self-inflicted knife wounds, the emergency clinician can provide appropriate referrals, conserve resources, and assist law enforcement in the investigation of an alleged crime. Thank you. And then you also testified um, about a red mark on uh, the defendant's neck, uh, right, right or left, I guess I'm not sure, but, um, and you indicated there was a number of, of things that it could be consistent with, correct? Correct. And um, would you agree that it also could be consistent with someone pushing on the neck to get someone's face out of their way? Um, it, it would require, uh, because it's more of an abrasion to my eye, um, it would require more friction, I think, than just skin on skin, um, but anything that could cause friction could cause it. So fabric from a vehicle or, um, yeah. Okay. okay. And um, are you familiar with uh, petechiae? Yes. And what is that? Um, petechiae are little tiny hemorrhages that are most frequently seen in the whites of the eyes or the eyelids and their little tiny burst blood vessels. Um, and you indicated at autopsy in your report that Alex was five foot eight inches and 137 pounds, is that correct? Yes, that's what the autopsy report said. And um, you basically testified that the defendant's wounds could be consistent with self-inflicted and also could be consistent with someone else inflicting those wounds, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and you're, doctor, you're being paid for your opinion today, correct? I'm being paid for my time, yes. Um, and prior to testifying here today, um, how much have you charged the defense? Um, so I charge $400 an hour and prior to today I had uh, about 19 hours and then I'll have whatever time I'm here today. And what's your uh, charge for testifying? Uh, it's just an hourly rate. And what's that hourly rate? $400. And do you get paid $400 for your travel time as well? Yes. So you've already been uh, charged or paid $7,600 and then you'll get additional for your time today. However long it takes today, yes. And um, in fact, yesterday you testified in a homicide <laughs> trial for... 
Just, well, what is the objection? The, the objection is what she testified to yesterday is irrelevant. She's well, what she testified to is irrelevant, but what would be the relevance? I, I mean, I, she's testified six times in the past 10 years for the defense that's been brought out. Okay. Well, I'll sustain the relevance in the test, who she, what she testified yesterday. And um, your only involvement in this case, though, it was because you've been hired by the defense. You didn't, you weren't involved as a fact witness at all. Correct. Nothing else. All right, any redirect? Yes, I do. What? Oh, okay. Um, All right, we're going to, uh, it's probably a good time to do it then. Pardon Before me. we continue with redirect, we have to um, switch out court reporters. So, oh, of course. I think this is probably a good time to take a short recess. So, we'll uh, take a 10 minute recess until uh, 9 45. Okay, all rise. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, Ms. Wisney, go ahead. You had something you want to put on the record? Your Honor, I have a request, a demand of the state to provide exculpatory evidence that has not previously been requested by the defense. However, it's been requested. Well, it's been requested now. I mean, we have a general request for all exculpatory evidence, but in light of counsel's questions as to the payment of Dr. Uh, Thomas, we would like, uh, we are aware that Dunn County Service, uh, I'm sorry, that Ramsey County's medical examiner services are not free for Dunn County, that Dunn County has been billed for the autopsy as well as the time that Dr. Mills um, has spent um, preparing for and testifying in this case as well as time uh, spent um, for meeting with the prosecutors and a request for exculpatory evidence is always timely, including post conviction. Um, so we have uh, requested that uh, Ms. Noldolf obtain those numbers for us. I don't expect them to be available this instant, but I would like them prior to the close of the defense case. All right. I don't know whether they've right. received a bill yet, but any objection on the part of the state? Uh, Your, Your Honor, we don't have an objection. I'm, I'm going to time. ask that Ms. Nodolf no, 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 respond. Your Honor, we get to decide who responds to arguments, and I'm responding. Your Honor, it's our position that that is not exculpatory information. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, there's payment. Uh, you know, officers are paid hourly wages for their work. Uh, contractors are paid hourly for their work. Uh, that are hired, they're, they're not hired to provide an opinion per se, they're hired to do work. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Dr. Mills is not paid by Dunn County, Dr. Mills is paid by Ramsey County, uh, and Ramsey County bills uh, Dunn County for any time. Uh, but it's not the same as what a witness is paid to uh, by a party for a specific opinion in a specific case. It's a totally different thing. It's not exculpatory. We're going, you know, I understand Ms. Uh, Nodolf has, has made the request and we're going to try to get the information for uh, the defense, uh, but it, we don't consider it exculpatory information. It is not exculpatory information. Uh, what, uh, uh, what Dunn County paid to Ramsey County to do an autopsy. Uh, as I understand it, and as I understand every county, there's a basically there's a set fee for an autopsy. You pay X amount of dollars for an autopsy, and then we reimburse uh, Ramsey County for time. But again, we're not paying Dr. Mills. Uh, Dr. Mills is being paid by Ramsey County, not by Dunn County. All right, well, I, again, I've never really heard of this issue before. Certainly the defense could have asked that question while Dr. Mills was testifying, but um, it, it, the state's not objecting to get that information. Any idea how, how long it would take to get a hold of that information, Ms. Nodal? I sent an email. Oh, I have no okay, perhaps maybe someone from your office can contact them, uh, you know, during a break, and maybe you can reach some sort of stipulation as to what the, you know, what the, fee was involved in terms of, you know, autopsy and, uh, uh, and for testimony. I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's fair. I mean, the defense, again, could have asked that when you had a witness who was on the stand. Um, and, uh, and I understand, uh, but exculpatory evidence would be evidence that would tend to, uh, uh, 
I guess, negate the guilt or lead to evidence that might be tend to make guilt less likely on the part of your client. I'm not sure how uh, an autopsy from, you know, a medical examiner's office would be exculpatory evidence, but if you're saying it goes to credibility just to show that the state's witnesses also receive a fee for their service, just as uh, defense witnesses receive a fee for their service. I mean, I, you know, it's more of an argument thing, a credibility thing. Um, but I, I certainly don't believe that um, the failure to this, of the state up to this point to having not provided the, the, the bill from the autopsy that, that they failed to disclose exculpatory evidence, just so that's clear. Okay. Well, Judge, and I, I'm not trying to say that. We, we made a general request. I'm now making a specific request, and I frankly didn't think of it because, quite honestly, I think questions about fees are silly, but since the state has made a big deal out of it, I'm making that request. That's well, you know, it, 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 it does go to credibility, and it's uh, generally uh, acceptable with, you know, professional witnesses and so forth, but I have never seen anyone ask, you know, uh, whether law enforcement officers are working for free or not. I mean, they all are getting paid for their time. So, uh, in any event. Maybe right, we're well, a little different than the other lawyers who've come before you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess I'm not going to enter an order I could, because the state has said that they will work diligently to get that information. And then again, perhaps the parties can just reach a stipulation. Another accommodation may be to allow the, you know, uh, the defense to call uh, Dr. Mills just to ask her that question by telephone if you wish. But We're not going to do that. Um, we'll just wait for the information. I'm sure that the uh, it can be obtained quite easily once somebody looks it up. All so right. We, we can handle it by stipulation. Yeah. Certainly, uh, again, a court-appointed expert previously cost a lot of money also. So uh, so I understand every, you know, people are doing this. Right. Um, everybody's getting paid. Well, almost everybody's getting yes. paid. Except us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I can't resist cracking jokes sometimes. Okay. Right. Um, are we ready to bring the jury back in, Mr. Nelson? Judge, after uh, this witness, uh, the defense intends to call Dr. Hopper. We just, again, request a break in between witnesses so that I can get set up. And I believe Mr. Hahn uh, may want to put issues about his testimony on the record. I, I don't want to speak for him, but I just knew that there was something that we would want to put on the record and it's probably easier to do outside of the presence of the jury than at a sidebar or something else. Okay. Well, I think it makes sense to break. How, well, you just have redirect, right? Yeah, so it's not very long. I, have okay. few I do have a few questions that were raised yeah. across. Well, I mean, I hate to bring in, you know, for a short redirect and then have the jury leave right away. <laughs> um, is there some way we can address that now? Is it, is it significant? Uh, how much time do you think it would take? Just a few minutes, I think, Judge. And, but the we, bigger thing is, I think, getting Dr. Hopper's so defense is... Just, we, that's all we've got today. So we've got, we've got plenty of time. I understand the bring him in, bring him out, but it would be a short break. So I guess I'll defer to your honor, but... Okay, well, I, why don't we do this? We'll finish up this witness, and I'll tell the jury that we're you know, going to have a few breaks today. I'll remind them that, you know, we said that right from the outset. There will be recesses from time to time. And... Uh, so we'll we'll do it that way then. Okay, so we'll let's finish up then with Dr. Thomas and then uh, we'll do the other. Okay, let's bring the jury in. Doctor, you were asked some questions about sharp force injuries number two to four. There was a picture on the screen. I won't bother to display it again, but um, those are the uh, that's the slice to the side of the neck. Um, can a person make that? injury without lifting the knife from the flesh? The knife, you know, continuously making contact as opposed to one wound lift, two wounds lift, three wound lift? Yes, yes. Okay, so that could easily be perceived as just one act as opposed to three separate acts, right? Right. Okay. Um, the next question I have has to do with pain. Um, you were asked questions about being in pain from the scrotal wound. Um, does everybody react to pain in the same way? No. Um, have you uh, seen in your practice where someone has eventually passed away, um, someone with substantial injuries, including painful injuries, who's walked and around afterwards? Yes. Or who's been able to function? Yes. Been able to fight? 
Yes. Been able to attack somebody? Yes. Okay. And um, you were also asked, um, well, about the bleeding from the jugular vein. And in terms of the bleeding from the jugular vein, um, and would that bleed very quickly, or does bleeding from a vein occur more slowly? So bleeding from a vein occurs more slowly than bleeding from an artery, because an artery will actually pump, will spurt, uh, whereas a, a vein isn't under the same pressure that blood pressure in an artery is. So it will leak out. Um, having said that, it's a pretty big vein, so it would leak out. Uh, you know, at a pretty significant amount um, and ultimately result in death if it's not staunched. And would, have you observed people who have received cuts to the neck where there's bleeding put a scarf around their neck in order to stem the bleeding? I haven't seen that personally, but um, I can certainly imagine the urge would be to try and stop the bleeding. Um, in terms of the bleeding from the head, the subdural, um, which I think uh, everybody agrees can ultimately be fatal, would it take a while for it to develop to that point? Um, again, there's a lot of variability, but uh, it takes a while, yes, for the amount of blood to accumulate in the brain or on the surface of the brain to put pressure on it. You were asked whether or not that wound could result in, I think, dizziness, disequilibrium, or perhaps I want to say disorientation. Is it also possible that it might not result in those things occurring? Yes. Okay. Um, by the way, um, you were asked a bunch of questions about getting paid. Are you aware uh, whether or not Ramsey County charges Dunn County for conducting autopsies and for the time of the forensic pathologist to come testify? I'm sure they do. All right, and when you were working as a medical examiner covering multiple counties, um, did your county charge for your time both performing an autopsy and testifying? Um, yes, there's a couple of ways it can be done. One is if, a, and different counties do it differently, but um, one is if your county gets reimbursed and you just keep your regular salary. But the other way, sometimes people will take a vacation day and then uh, they'll get paid themselves. So different places do it different ways. But is it fair to say that when you were doing this, you were paid also in addition to doing the autopsy or if the county was paid, whether you were paid or the county was paid, the county that was using the information had to pay for time meeting with you T testimony time, travel time, all of those things? Sure, yes. Okay. Um, you were asked some questions about exhibit number uh, 145, and um, I'm going to ask you about those as well. Um, if I could please have the Elmo on. Okay. And what I'm specifically going to ask you about are the things that are in this box characteristics of self-inflicted knife wounds, correct? Yes. Um, one of the, um, uh, can you please look at these factors and tell us, uh, when they talk about characteristics, first of all, is it fair to say that characteristics mean commonly seen? Yes. Okay. And what about sparing of sensitive body areas? Can you explain what that means? So the thought behind this is that if someone is cutting themselves, um, they will, well, first of all, it obviously can only occur in areas that the person can reach themselves. And it also tends to be in areas that are easier to reach. And the thought is that people won't do it in areas that are super sensitive. So they tend to do it on their thighs or their uh, forearms, uh, someplace, but not uh, genitalia, I would say. And what about the mons pubis, labia, or generally near the area of the very inner thigh, or I guess what we might call the crotch? Would that be what you would call a sensitive area? Yes. Okay. Um, does it also note that um, 
These wounds are usually on the non-dominant side of the body? Yes. Okay. You can turn this off. Now, I want to ask you about, um, you were saying that as a forensic pathologist, sometimes, first of all, there's a provisional autopsy report is done and then a final autopsy report is done, correct? Yes. Why is that? Well, not all offices do a provisional autopsy report, um, but for the offices that do, the idea is you want to get information back to the investigating agencies to let them know sort of what you found initially and what your initial thoughts are. And then once, as the forensic pathologist, you've gotten more information, whether it's medical, past medical history or scene or social or all of the information that you might get um, about the person or whether it's additional toxicology or other laboratory tests or microscopic exam, things like that, that then uh, you put it all together and only then when you have feel like you have all the information you need do you do the final autopsy. All right. Is it fair to say that in medicine one can reach an initial opinion but if further facts come to a physician's attention that it can be appropriate to revise a diagnosis? Absolutely. And does that apply to emergency room physicians as well as people in your field? Objection, relevance, and calling for speculum. Stated. Uh, I'd like to approach. All right, the objection is sustained. Uh, and just to rephrase. Yes, I'm gonna rephrase my question. Um, I guess what I'm asking you is this, in all fields of medicine, if a doctor receives further information about a patient if that doctor is still involved with that patient, is it appropriate to revise their opinion? Yes. Okay. And if the doctor's not still involved with the patient, but there are other physicians who look and discover other materials later, is it appropriate to say that their diagnosis may be more complete received based on receiving additional information? Yes. Okay. Um, and finally, I just want to ask you about the uh, marks to Miss McCandless's neck. Um, uh, and you talked about, I think you used the word fabric against the neck. So what I just want to ask is her neck um, abrasion, I believe you called it an abrasion, could it be caused, when you say fabric, from clothing such as shirts or multiple layers of shirts or sweaters? Yes. Okay, I don't have anything further. Any uh, recross? Um, just briefly, um, doctor, can briefly when you do an autopsy um, from start to finish, how long does that take in general? Oh, it really depends. Um, if it's a healthy young person who dies of a drug overdose and they have no injuries, it might take an hour. If it's uh, a potential homicide with multiple injuries, it could take. Uh, <coughs> I mean, sometimes it'll take all day, depending. Sure. And so in this case, when there's 16... Ju Judge, I don't think that's within the scope of the cross. So I, I'm right. Objections beyond the scope. All right, yep. sustained in that. Um, and I asked you on uh, direct if you had... You never examined the body of Alexander Woodworth, and you also never examined the body of the defendant, Ezra McCandless, correct? Correct. All you saw were pictures of any scratches. Correct? Correct. Uh, nothing else. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I think that you're free to go. Is that right. true? Okay. So anyway, thank you, and uh, you have a good day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I had in my uh, pattern instruction, which I've been reading to you each evening, um, and I've left this, this part out on those because it didn't apply, but
at the beginning of the trial, I said we will stop or recess from time to time during the trial. Again, you may be excused in the courtroom when it's necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. Um, that certainly has happened and it's, it's going to happen here right now. So we're going to give you, I hate to have you coming in and going out, but uh, before the next witness, uh, there are just some things that we just have to, to talk about and uh, address. Uh, it shouldn't take very long. Um, and, uh, and also, we're getting to the point where we can give you a, kind of a, an idea of what the remaining schedule will be, but I don't want to do that until after this next witness. And I, uh, I don't know how, you know, I'll talk with the attorneys and, you know, and see. We're also going to discuss the issue of, um, you know, whether uh, you'll be sequestered during your deliberations or not. That's something that, you know, I don't know that it's absolutely mandatory, um, but that's just something to think about. I know that some of you may have had questions about that, um, and uh, but we're, we have to talk about that before I can, you know, talk to you about that. But in any event, this is one of those things we have some business to take care of, and I anticipate we'll probably, uh, council have any idea, maybe maybe 15 minutes, something like that. So in any event, we'll bring you back in as soon as we're ready to go, okay? All right, all rise. Okay, uh, I'd like to take up then any issues related to Dr. Hopper that we need to address before he testifies. So uh, who wants to go with that? And that's going to be Mr. Nelson and uh, Mr. Hahn, is that right? Yes, and so maybe I'll just start because it, 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 Dr. Hopper is going to testify in our uh, disclosure of his opinions, which I know there was much discussion about um, in its document 227, Your Honor. The last paragraph uh, is when the defense had disclosed what his opinion would be. Um, I have informed uh, Mr. Hahn that the question that I will ask related to that last paragraph is as follows. Were Ezra McCandless's March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, 2018 statements consistent with the principles you've testified about? Question mark. He would then answer, I may or I may not ask how so, because I may have already covered that. But I am not going to be using all of the words that I had previously indicated uh, based upon my discussions with Mr. Hahn. So I don't know if he has uh, further discussion or wants to just uh, flesh that out some more, but that's what the defense wanted to uh, let everybody know. Okay, Mr. Hahn? My concern is is addressed with the rewording of the question that's anticipated to be asked of Dr. Hopper, because it was initially, is it consistent with the brain being under attack? And I think that suggests that he would be testifying as to whether or not she actually was attacked, so testifying to her truthfulness of her statements and something that's in the province of the jury. So as long as we, as long as questioning and Dr. Hopper stay within the lines of the principles that he talks about are, or the, the interviews that he reviewed are, have portions that are consistent with uh, the principles that he will have already testified to, I think that's fair game. Um, but if it goes outside of there, you, you'll hear some objections. Okay. So this isn't going to take a real long time, then, is it? No, <laughs> okay. I think I, so. We're in agreement. Me, but I just wanted to make a record okay. so we were clear when we got there that we we're all on the same page. All right. Okay. About it more if you want. <laughs> well, do you, do you have do you have some more? <laughs> no, Jeff. Uh, okay. Well, I did want to discuss with that council a little bit. You know, I had said earlier. Uh, that it's mandatory to sequester a jury in a first degree uh, or class A felony. And, uh, and it certainly was prior to a recent revision. I, and so I did, did some checking and, uh, and there's still potentially some concern uh, with the constitutional dimension on that. But um, section 972.12, uh, it used to have a subsection two and, and it was modified, I think, in a 1987 uh, piece of legislation, again in 1991, and subsection 2 was repealed in 1991, or it was 1991 Act 39, I believe it was. In any event, the way that it currently reads uh, appears that it's within the court's discretion as to sequester the jury, uh, whether it's a 
first degree intentional homicide trial or not. Um, and uh, what I'd like the parties to think about as we are planning, uh, you know, the closing days of this trial uh, is to whether, uh, you know, what I want input from, from the parties. Uh, we certainly would be prepared to sequester the jury once the case would go to them. It may be the more prudent thing to do. On the other hand, uh, you know, there are potentially downsides with that as well. Uh, obviously, the jury has been instructed repeatedly on not uh, watching any news reports or not listening to any conversations, so on. Um, and uh, but there is, uh, I think, uh, really a uh, saturation of coverage about this matter. And uh, but they would essentially be potentially exposed to that every day. So uh, if we did continue, I mean, if things work out uh, where we would uh, instruct the jury first thing on Friday morning and, you know, in closing arguments, uh, perhaps, you know, it would be a moot issue. But if we get to Friday evening, you know, if the jury has had a long day, you know, the court has to make that decision at that point in time. And uh, so I just want counsel to think about that. I, you don't have to break, okay. argue it right now, but I just want you to have bear that in mind. And obviously, Judge, if... Uh we should probably know that before Friday because if they're going to be sequestered, we can't have them go home to grab their bag. Well, that's just it. I mean, that's what I, I want to be able to tell the jury. Um, and that's the other thing is if I want to tell them whether they, sh they should pack, you know, an overnight uh, bag. Um, but also, um, you know, it may end up, you know, being a bus ride to a nearby town just be given the hotel situations and so forth. So... Um, so we have to, you know, that's one thing we're thinking about. Uh, okay, Mr. Nelson. Regarding that issue, Judge, is it, and I'm sure the answer is probably it depends, but I, it's your honor's practice to let them deliberate until 4.30, 8 o'clock, midnight, defer to the, I mean, how long, you know, the question to me is how long would they be in sequestration if they're, if they're essentially deliberating until midnight, they go home and sleep and come back. That's different than if they deliberate until 6 p.m. And then there uh, may or may not be in sequestration. So that's one of the things that the, at least the defense would like to know um, so that we can have that information before we make that decision. All right. Okay. Well, you know, and I would, uh, I would like to get some input from the jury on what they think. So maybe uh, ask the bailiff to ask them to think about that and give some feedback. Yeah, and Judge, my, I mean, my... My preference as it relates, first off, is to sequestration. I don't think the state's going to have a position one way or the other on that. I'm, I think uh, whatever decision Your Honor makes is, is fine with the state. As to how long they deliberate, I think that's just best left up to them, not even discuss it ahead of time. But, you know, when, you know my, what I think is typically makes sense is to just tell them, look, you know, we're not going to keep you here overnight or, you know, all night if you need to, if you want to take a break and, you know, uh, start again in the morning, just let the bailiff know. Uh, or, if, you know, because I've seen juries wait and, you know, deliberate for, you know, until later in the evening and uh, they don't want to take that break. And I've seen others that say, look, we're tired, we want to take a break, and right. we don't want to continue. And I think you just need to leave that up to them and what their feelings are on it. they I've never seen a jury that's shy about telling the court that we want to just continue or we want to take a break. Yeah, I, I agree, Mr. DeFore, and I, I see it that way. I think the jury, you know, when you get to that point, if it, when the case goes to them, that uh, I will uh, give their input considerable weight. Okay, um, and so that sort of covers what I wanted to just address then uh, here and maybe a few other things. Um, so we're ready to bring the jury back in. Are we ready for Dr. Hopp? I just, I need to go and get him. I need to plug in my computer. I need some exhibits marked, so certainly by 10 the restroom break? Yes. Okay. So, all right, then we'll just take a brief recess. You think